Hey guys, so today we're going to be talking about calculating the cost of debt. And this is uh, something that you, is usually done when you're calculating the discount rate you will use to value a company. Now a discount rate is an investor's desired rate of return, generally considered to be the investor's opportunity cost of capital. And so say for example you're an investor and you're considering four investment options, A, B, C, and D. If you decide to go with option B, there's an implicit opportunity cost that exists when you forego options A, C, and D. And the discount rate used to value value future cash flows accounts for that opportunity cost that exists when you choose to go with it, that respective investment option. And the most common discount rate used is the weighted average cost of capital, which is the average cost of financing a company's debt. It's two main sources of, of capital. Now, to calculate the weighted average cost of capital, the WAC formula is by multiplying the cost of equity by the proportion of equity to the total market value of capital, plus the after-tax cost of debt times the proportion of debt to the company's total market value of capital. And this makes sense, like the weighted average cost of capital, there are two sources of capital, equity and debt. You're looking at their respective costs and you're calculating the weighted average. So this formula is relatively simple to understand. In this video, we're gonna be focusing on getting the after-tax cost of debt number. Where does that uh, number come from? A lot of students will usually go to the financial statements and they'll calculate the percentage of uh, interest paid versus the total uh, obligations of that company. And that's what they will use for that number. But you'll actually see that there are a lot of assumptions that are excluded. There are four methods to calculating the cost, uh, cost of debt. The yield to maturity approach, the debt rating approach, the synthetic rating approach, and the use of the interest rate, which I talked about already. Now, if you can't find a cost of, uh, of debt number through each of these three methods, only then should you be using the interest rate on bank debt. Because in the end, when you look at bank debt, now bank debt is not publicly traded, so the market value of that bank debt is not available. Right, it does not change. But when we're looking at the weighted average cost of, cost of capital formula, these weighted averages are the market value of equity and the market value of debt relative to the market value of total capital. So it changes uh, based on the economic conditions that exist in, in the company's environment. Right, So you, you'll see that the fourth option is actually the most uh, inaccurate option when it comes to estimating the cost of debt. Now, the first option is the yield to maturity approach. And just a quick definition, the yield to maturity is the rate at which the current market price of the bond is equal to the present value of all the cash flows from the bond. And this is actually the best method to really estimate the current cost of debt based on, on the market value of debt. Because in the end, the yield to maturity is the current yield on that bond relative to its price. So if the bond is trading below market value, its yield to maturity will be higher than the coupon rate. And if it's trading above face value, then its yield to maturity will be lower than the coupon rate. And the three steps to, cal uh, to, the, to this approach are to first calculate the yield to maturity of all publicly traded company debt, so the bonds that they have issued, then calculate the weighted average of all debt instruments, and then multiply that result by one minus the effective tax rate to get your after tax cost of debt. Now, say for example, we're looking at Apple's issued bonds. Thankfully enough, Morningstar provides this information to anyone. All you have to do is Google it, type in Apple bonds, and you'll you'll find this uh, this kind of dashboard. And you can see here that actually there are a lot more bonds you can scroll down, but essentially each bond, so this one, we'll take for example the first one. So Apple, this 2.4% coupon bond, it was issued, they issued $5.5 billion of this bond. It is currently be tr being traded at below face value, so it's trading at $98.30 for every $100 and its fixed coupon is 2.4 and its yield to maturity the current yield to maturity is 2.69 because once again the uh, the uh, the uh, bond is trading below face value now the yield to maturity approach essentially takes all of these bonds calculates the weighted yield to maturity and then it assumes to be that is assumed to be the cost of debt pre-tax you multiply it with after the tax rate and then you get your after tax cost of debt but for simplicity's sake, let's take a look at an example where Apple has three bonds. They have a 2.4% uh, bond, a 1% coupon rate bond, and a 4.65% coupon rate bond. Essentially what you have to do is, again, if this information is publicly available and this is their, all their debt load, this is their entire debt load, then you can just go on uh, Morningstar. You can look at what the bond is currently trading at. So this bond is trading at below face value, below face value, and this one's actually trading at a premium, so above face value. 
then you gen you then just calculate the uh, the current market value of that debt of the bond. So say for example for the first one the 2.4 percent coupon it's trading at 98 dollars and 30 cents relative to 100 dollars. So the discount rate would be 0.983. And so you multiply that times 5.5 billion to get a 5.4065 billion dollar uh, market value for this existing bond. And you do that for all three of these options to calculate the total market value of that, which in this case would be 13.7825 uh, billion uh, Canadian dollars or US dollars, whichever one you want to use. Now, to calculate the yield to maturity and to calculate the average yield to maturity, you need to calculate based on the weighted average. So you would, for the first bond, you'd look at how much of it does it make up the entire market value of, of the company's debt. The second one, how much is the weighting relative to total market value debt and how much is the third one as well. And then you take the existing yield to maturities and you multiply the weighting by that yield to maturity to get a weighted yield to maturity for this respective company of 2.73%. So in this example, if we're looking at these three bonds, and these are the these are the only bonds and debt available to this company, then the cost of that, the pre-tax cost of debt, would be two point seven three percent. You then just calculate uh, one minus the effective tax rate, which in this case would be forty percent, to get a after-tax cost of debt of one point six four percent. This is actually the most accurate method to, to estimate the current cost of debt because again on a day-to-day -day basis these bonds will change in value and therefore their yield to maturity will change in value thus reflecting the current cost of debt this is the best the best and most accurate method to use now the method i like to use when i'm personally building models is the debt rating approach and say for example in some cases the company uh, the the company might have some bonds but it might also have some bank debt so that the market information for that is not available in the end it's between the company and the bank well in that case then you can kind of produce a proxy cost which kind of represents the base represents the cost of that based on the company's credit rating so the formula for this is essentially you're adding uh, the default spread which is the default spread associated with that company's respective credit rating to the risk-free rate and then multiplying it time by one minus the effective tax rate and so the key to remember here is that the risk-free rate that we use is essentially the length of the bank debt or the the term of that bond that was issued so say for example a company has a 10-year bond or has a 10-year loan with a bank then you are using the 10-year treasury yield in the end the risk-free rate in any valuation will depend upon when the cash flow payment is expected to occur so that's really important that's something that you should apply whenever you are considering the risk-free rate in addition to Kate in the capital asset pricing model I made a separate video on that and I also referenced that so that's really important to remember it always occurs when the cash flow payment is expected to occur okay so in this case to count to find the default spread you look at uh, well for for me i took a, the moody's benchmark and i looked at if it's the company is rated has a triple a credit rating then the default spread is implied to be about 0.2 percent if the company has a triple c credit rating then their implied uh default spread would be about five percent and so once you know the company's credit rating you go to this benchmark which you can find on google and then you you take the default spread add it to the risk-free rate which matches the term length of the bond or the bank debt and then you multiply it by one minus the tax rate to get your after tax cost of debt. Now let's look at an example. Consider ABC Corp, a national US retailer with a credit rating of A. The company has a bank loan of 1.2 billion US dollars maturing in 11 years. The effective tax rate reported in the most recent quarter was 33% and the current yield on a 10-year treasury bond is 2.38%. Now the the now the bank loan is is due in 11 years. So the principal is due in 11 years. So taking the 10-year treasury bond is the closest benchmark to really calculate the risk-free rate so in this case that's why we chose the 10-year treasury bond which is currently yielding 2.38 percent so first the first step that we need to do is we need to find okay so we know the credit rating is a we need to find the the company's uh, default spread so the default spread for a a credit rating is one percent we add that to the risk-free rate of 2.38 percent and then multiply it by one minus the effective tax rate of 33 percent to get a for abc corp a after-tax cost of debt of 2.27 percent so that is the company's after-tax cost of that. This is relatively simple to do instead of just going on Bloomberg and going on Morningstar and calculating the weighted average yield to maturity, you can kind of find a proxy by using the debt rating approach. And this is the one that I prefer to use. 
Now, I will li also like to comment on uh, an important consideration when using the debt rating approach. Uh, you, if the company is, say, for example, you are a Canadian or U.S. investor, if the company is uh, headquartered in emerging markets or gets a lot of their revenues from emerging markets, then you also have to con consider a country spread because there are additional geopolitical risks that need to be factored in from both the um, cost of equity side in addition from the cost of debt side. So you add a country spread, which is as essentially another benchmark. You can go on Google, you look at the country's uh, current rating, the current credit rating for its local sovereign currency currency and then find the equivalent uh, country spread for that and add that to your equation. And the only thing that changes when you are uh, calculating the cost of debt for an emerging market co uh, company is that you're adding the risk-free rate plus the default spread plus the country spread now. So in domestic companies, you'd only consider the these two, the risk-free rate and the default spread for emerging market countries, uh, for emerging market companies or companies that uh, that get a lot of the revenues from that uh, from those countries, you can you must also add the country spread. Now, the third method is the estim estimating the synthetic rating. So the rating for a firm can be estimated using the financial characteristics of that firm. The rating can be estimated from the interest coverage ratio. And so the interest coverage ratio is essentially the earnings before interest and tax, so EBIT, divided by the company's interest expenses in that respective period. Once you determine your default spread, you can use the credit rating approach to calculate the cost of debt. So what, essentially what we have to do is we need to calculate, if we don't know the credit rating of a company, we can we can estimate and produce a synthetic rating by co com computing the interest coverage ratio, looking at a ben benchmark to find the equivalent uh, credit rating, and then inputting that into our debt rating uh, approach. So here's a quick benchmark that I use. This is provided by Moody's, and actually uh, New York University also provides a similar example. Uh, so based on, say for example, the company has a credit interest coverage ratio of seven. So it's between 6.5 and 8.5. Then the equivalent, uh, the estimated bond rating for that company would be double A. And so your default spread would be 0.5%. Say for example, the, if the company is doing very poorly, it has an interest coverage ratio of 0.9 then it would have an equivalent a bond rating of a triple C, which adds a 5% uh, default spread to the uh, debt rating approach. Now, once you f find the equivalent and you produce that synthetic rating, then you can calculate the defa default spread and just follow the same uh, method you did in your uh, debt rating approach. So let's consider an example. What is the cost of debt for XYZ Corp, a Brazilian manufacturer which recently reported EBIT of 7.827 million US dollars? XYZ's interest expense was $1,972. Uh, the effective tax rate was 27%, the country spread was 4.6%, and the relevant risk free rate was 3.9%. So in this example, the first thing that we have to do is we need to calculate the interest coverage ratio for the company to determine the equivalent uh, bond rating for that respective company. Then we estimate the synthetic rating and then calculate the after-tax cost of debt using the debt rating approach that we did in our previous slides. So to calculate the interest coverage ratio, so the EBIT for the company is 7.827 million and divide that by 1,972,000,000 1, and to get an interest coverage ratio of 3.97. That is our interest coverage. We then look at the benchmark that I provided in the earlier slides. So 3.97 will fall between three and 4.25. And so we'd have an equivalent bond rating of A minus, which adds a 1.25% default spread. Then we take that default spread and we take all of the relevant information provided in the question and then just apply the uh, the debt rating approach. So we add our rest free rate, which is 3.9%, uh, the default spread, which is 1.25%. And in this case, because it's a Brazilian manufacturer, we also add the country spread of 4.6% to then get an after-tax cost of debt of 7.12%. Uh, so the final method, and this is the one unfortunately that a lot of people use, but again, it does not change. This this uh, this cost of debt will remain the same in whatever market, and that is inaccurate when you're calculating the existing market value of that debt. But this method considers how much interest a company is paying for its existing obligations. It should only be used if the yield to maturity and debt rating approaches are not possible. So you divide the interest expense by the firm's debt obligations, short plus long-term debt, and then calculate the after-tax of debt. And this is usually what a lot, a lot of people do. So consider an example. ABC Corp uh, has the following debt. So it has one long-term obligation of $1, $1 million, has another long-term obligation of $2 million, and a short-term obligation of 200000 This is the uh, interest that they're paying on, those, uh, on that bank debt and the total interest paid for that year. 
and the total loan value. So all their their total um, obligations. And so essentially, you just divide 202,000 by 3.2 million to get your um, your pre-tax cost of debt of 6.131%, uh, then multiply it by one minus the effective tax rate to get our after-tax cost of debt of 4.61%. This will not change. So regardless of what the market is currently valuing their 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 potential bonds at, if the company only has bank debt, the bank debt will not change and its interest will always be this. And this, therefore, their cost of debt will remain consistent with this, which in some cases is okay if the company does not have a lot of bonds, but if the company does have bonds, and actually I'll make this note right now. So say for example, a company ha has issued one bond and has one, uh, some bank debt. If you can't if if you can't calculate the debt rating, then use the yield to maturity. Just go and look at the bond. Don't go to the bank debt. First, consider the bond. Consider the yield to maturity and what the market is current currently valuing their debt at, because that will give you a much more accurate perspective of the company's cost of debt. Now, a side note: what is considered debt? Now, debt should be all interest-bearing obligations, short-term as well as uh, long-term. And in addition, I'll make a separate video series on this. Uh, it should also include the present value of commitments, such as operating leases. So say, for example, you're looking at an airline company that uh, leases out their planes. If you were to only include the company's uh, long-term and short-term debt, then that would inaccurately display the company's existing market value of debt because you'd have to capitalize the company's operating lease and then account for that as uh, as debt. So I'll make a separate video on that, but it's important to remember when you're calculating the market value of debt and the total uh, market value of debt, it's important to also uh, consider the present value of commitments such as operating leases. So a quick overview, the four methods to calculating the cost of debt are the yield to maturity approach, the debt rating approach, the est estimating the synthetic rating, and then applying the debt rating formula, or the fourth one, using the interest rate on bank debt. Other than that, I hope you got, hope this video was really helpful, guys. If you do have any questions or didn't understand some of the slides, please comment below, and I'll be sure to get back to you as, as soon as possible. Other than that, please like and subscribe to my channel. I really like making these videos, and I can't wait to be uh, helping out more people soon. So have a great day, guys.